Welcome to Greenhouse. You can have a seat. I want to welcome every one of you that is joining us. Some of you are around the state. We love what is going on all over, everywhere. Some of you are down in South Florida. I want to welcome you guys that are in Davie right now. Some of you are in Orlando. Welcome to you as well. Some of you are at Kanapaha right now. There's a, a picnic happening in just a little while over at Kanapaha Park. In fact, I'll be joining you guys for lunch afterwards, so uh, somebody make sure there's some good chocolate somewhere, because that'll be good. That's going to be nice. Today we're going to start a series, though, that is about the controversial sayings of Jesus. And I want you to stand to your feet, actually, one more time, uh, because we're going to read from John chapter 3. By the way, yesterday was uh, little Zoe's birthday, I think, down there in, with Zara and Cindy. So happy birthday to Zoe. Zara, please give her a little kiss for me. And uh, Troy and Heather, please... <laughs> You better be enjoying this new fatherhood, motherhood moments. These are pretty great. But today we're going to look at a controversial saying of Jesus, and for a couple of months we're going to be thinking and chewing on some of these controversial sayings of Jesus. We're going to start here in chapter 3, verse 1 of John, and it says this, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do. Unless God is with him, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Look at one of your neighbors and say, you must be born again. Look at another neighbor and say, you must be born again. Father, I now pray that you move in power, that you open blind eyes, deaf ears, raise the dead in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted, amen. amen. You can have a seat. Uh, I do believe very much that in the next few moments, there are going to be some very, very uh, life-altering things that are going to happen. I don't want to hype this up. I don't want to exaggerate this. Uh, but frankly, I believe that in the next few moments that there are going to be people's lives that ha will be changed for the rest of their eternal existence. Uh, some of you that are watching right now, maybe even some of you that are watching online, now don't, it doesn't matter what country you're in, what part of the country you're in, uh, right now, even if you're watching this in the future, I want you to get your heart ready and your soul ready. And I would invite every one of you to even pray in your heart right now, God, speak freshly to me right now. So John 3 is where we're looking, talking about a controversial saying of Jesus, and the saying is, verse 7, you must be born again. My burden today is twofold. On one hand, I'm burdened for those who are born from God and they're not enjoying it. They're born again from above by God and they're not walking in the joy of their salvation. They're not enjoying that. They're not rejoicing in God. And I, I am very deeply wanting for every one of you that has been born from God to have today a sense of the joy of the covenant that you are in with the God of that covenant. If you belong to Jesus, you'll never be forsaken. If you've been born from God, you've got access, you've got inheritance, you've got life, you're never going to die, you'll never be forsaken. You've got nothing to fear if you belong to God. Likewise, I am burdened for those who are living in a Christian culture, some of you, maybe the Bible Belt, maybe you got raised in a Christian family, I'm burdened for people that think they're okay and they're not. People that might assume that because they checked off a box on a card many years ago that said, you know, I want to follow Jesus, that because they checked the card off or because they said a little prayer or something like that, that maybe they have thought that they are okay when in fact they are not okay. And today is the day where I want to make it clear to us the great news that Scripture says these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life, that you can know that you know that you know that you know that you have eternal life. And for some of you that are not walking with God yet, this is your day. You picked the greatest day to ever tune in and watch something or the greatest day to come into a church building. This is that day. You must be born again. So we got three stops. Number one, there is a whole new life available in Jesus. Verse one, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. It's an important little detail that we'll get to in a second. Verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is 
with him. Now, he comes by night. It's fascinating because he's a ruler of the Pharisees. He's a ruler of the Jews. The guy's got clout. He's got swag. He's probably driving a camel with hubcap kneecaps. He's got cool stuff going on, and yet he's coming by night. He's coming to Jesus stealth, incognito. He's coming in a way that no one's going to see him, even though he's got a whole bunch of stuff going on. I mean, this, he writes books. People read, writes a blog. People check out. He's kind of famous everywhere he goes, and yet when he comes to Jesus, he comes by night. Why? Some time ago, I had a cold sore, bad cold sore breaking out. I don't know if any of you guys get cold sores. I hate cold sores. They're, it's like a plague. I uh, don't like cold sores at all. Don't enjoy them at, at all. I don't like the, uh, the medical description of cold sores. I don't like any of that. And uh, I had a cold sore, and I had to go. I was like, man, that's it. I got to go get some medicine. And so I made my way to a CVS, and I didn't want to go during the day. I wanted to see as few people as possible. So I went at night. Sure enough, I get there, and I'm thinking, I don't want anyone to recognize me. I don't want someone to say, hey, Mike, or something. you know. And so, hey, Pastor Mike, whatever. And uh, so I go in, and I go late at night, and sure enough, at CVS, there's a whole line of people. I'm thinking, oh, man. What a bummer. So I go, I've got my medicine kind of holding it, you know, trying to hold it to the side kind of thing. And, and uh, so I'm like, oh, check it out. The pharmacy was open in the back. And so I go to the back to the pharmacy, and I'm thinking, this is good. And there was no one in line at the pharmacy. So I go back there to the back, and I walk up, and I see the clerk, you know, behind there. And sure enough, the clerk turns around and goes, oh, Pastor Mike, <laughs> how can I help you? And I was like, can you tell me where the chapstick is? You know, I'm trying to find the chapstick. And I just said, I'll come back another day. Why was Nicodemus coming at night? Because ever since the garden, we've been on the run. We've been, we've been ashamed. We've had this, this hiding streak to us. He, he sees something in Jesus, and yet he's coming at night. Jesus is the Lord, and yet many other Pharisees don't like this, and many other people weren't sold on this, and, and they didn't even think he was coming from God. And He says, you're a teacher that came from God, and, and you teach, you're, you're a teacher, and you're from God, and you do miracles. He's affirming every single bit of that. I just find it beautiful. That even though he's coming at the wrong time and he's coming in the wrong way and he's doing this with the wrong priorities, I love the fact that Jesus meets us where we are, not where we should be. Aren't you glad that Jesus will meet you where you are? Do you know how many testimonies in our church go like this? Man, how did you, how did you connect with God? Man, there was this girl. How many times I hear that story, you know, of some guy. His motives were bad. His motives were lust. But it ends up coming and they meet God and everything changes. I'm so glad Jesus takes even those that come by night. Maybe someone's, maybe you're watching this on a podcast later on and you know you're not right with God and this is your day and I'm supposed to tell you, get right with God. Call out to God today. Be changed. Maybe you're sitting at Kanapa Hall right now and you're like, I don't even know where I stand exactly with God. This is your day. This is your day. I'm so glad Jesus is not afraid of the dark. He overcomes the dark. Verse 3, Jesus hears this great uh, compliment. Of course, you're a teacher, came from God, you do great signs. And he says in verse 3, I tr- say to you truly, truly, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, Nicodemus, you're a theist, it's not enough. You're a monotheist, it's not enough. You believe in miracles, it's not enough. You're doctrinally correct, it's not enough. You can be doctrinally accurate, morally upright, a really good guy in everybody's eyes, and it's still not enough. You must be born again. You must be born all over again. He says it's something that is so supernatural that it's, it's like describing a new birth. It's not a rehab. I was listening to Bill Mayer talk about rehab programs and or Bill Maher, however you say his name, and he said, you know, I'm with Charlie Sheen. Now, whenever anyone says I'm with Charlie Sheen, you know, take the rest of it in an interesting light, right? But he says, I'm a Charlie Sheen. Rehab programs are interesting places. It's like you check into a hotel where they tell you you're a rotten person until you finally nod your head and then they let you out. Let me tell you, Jesus is not a hotel that you check into like a cockroach who tells you that you're so rotten until you nod your head and you get to go check out. Jesus so loved you that he's done something so pervasive and supernatural that he makes you brand new. He's not giving you rehab. He's giving you a remake. He's giving you a real life, a new life. There is a whole new life available. To which Nicodemus says in verse 4, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Number one, Nicodemus, gross, okay? Number two, Nicodemus, you're a rabbi. You're a leader of the Jews. 
And Jesus was not the first rabbi that ever talked about rebirth. You're not being really honest here right now. In fact, even today, some of you perhaps are here, and maybe you've heard the term born again, and you might say, yeah, I believe in being born again, but you, lowercase b, believe in born again with a lowercase b, and today's the day to go all in and to get born from God. How, he says. How can these things be? Verse 5, Jesus says, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse 3, he says, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom. Now he says you cannot enter the kingdom. Now, there's a kingdom. What he's describing here, being born again means you're being birthed into a new kingdom, that you're getting a new passport, that you've got a new citizenship, that you're a new person, new identity. There's something new that's taking place. It's so pervasive, so holistic, so all the way around. It's radically different that if this is true of your life, I'm praying today, all of you right now that are in South Florida, you're sitting there in Western, that your soul would be thrilled at who you are in God. But he says it's like this. It's like a kingdom. So missionary Sam came over. Um, you know, missionary Sam spends his life planting churches, and he rescues slaves, and he's been beaten for his faith. He's been jailed for his faith. And he said, hey, Mike, I'm bringing my family to the United States. I'm going to have my wife and my son. I'm going to have uh, my mom and my brother. Um, and he said, can I come see you guys? I'm like, oh, yeah, come see. And I said, in fact, you know what I'm going to do? I want to treat you. When you come, have you ever heard of the Magic Kingdom? It's like, what's that? Have you ever heard of Disney World? Now, I'm, I, know, I realize I'm about to do the best commercial Disney's ever heard, but here it is. He says, I'm coming over. And I'm like, okay, uh, that's it, man. You suffer for Jesus. When you come here, I'm taking you to Disney World. Now, how many of you like the fact that I took Missionary Sam to Disney World? Anyone like that? All right, get ready to go take him. I'm like, we're going to take you to Disney World. They show up. They're at their hotel. I'm ready to go. Now, here's how I do Disney World. For me, I prefer to do Disney World something like this. If you're going to go to Disney, it's so expensive. Are we in touch with how expensive it is? All right. I've got a family of 10. I have eight children, highly fertile wife, which means we haven't gone to Disney for five children. It's been five. That's how we don't think in years. We think in terms of children. Five children ago was the last time I went to Disney because ha we'd have to second mortgage our house to go to Disney World. I can't do that. So we said, we're not going to go do this. We don't go, we're not going to go to Disney. But he's coming. I said, we're going to go to Disney. If you are going to go, you get there the minute it opens. You stay till the minute it's done, and you go on one of those desperate DisneyVisitor.com websites, you get an Excel spreadsheet, you get fast passes, you get the plan, when do you go, what's the best time of the day to get the lowest rides, uh, the lowest lines and all the rides, and by the time it's done, you can get it down to something like five bucks a ride. You're hoping to do something like that. So he's coming. They're at the hotel, talking on the phone. You guys ready? No, 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 not ready yet. You guys ready? No, 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 we're just, we're just kind of, they're, they're hanging out at the hotel and doing their thing, and f finally we... We, we finally get, and I'm kind of watching the clock and thinking through the whole thing, and, and uh, we finally make it to Disney World. We're walking into the Magic Kingdom. It's a little bit afternoon, you know, lunchtime, and, and I'm freaking out, you know, and uh, getting, walking up to the ticket counter to go buy the tickets, you know. Uh, are these Florida residents? No, not really Florida residents special or anything like that. And walking up, hey, can I go up and help him? Like, no, no, I'll cover this. So I walk up to the ticket counter myself, look at the price. There's six of us going to Disney and, you know, go ahead and do this. So, you know, what, can, do you want to have a park hopper? Oh, yeah, let's just do the park hopper. That way we can get the whole experience, whatever. I want to treat anything they want, we're going to go do. We get by the tickets. You know, I swipe the credit card. I swallow very <laughs> deeply. We walk into Disney. They, we, as soon as we get in, the eyes are all opening. And we're taking pictures of, of, of Mickey Mouse shrubs and, and Donald Duck characters. And, and we're on a ferry boat. And, man, I mean, the pictures are just going crazy, you know. Never seen anything like this. We get in there. We start going around. And we go, I'm like, man, I'm buying you anything. You want Mickey? Mickey Mouse bars, we're riding you Mickey Mouse bars, his little son, one of them have everything, you know, we're there, we're there about two and a half, three hours, after about three hours, they kind of all look at me, they're like, well, we're done, I said, oh no, we're not, we're not done, you know what I mean, we're done, it's like three o'clock, three thirty, we're not done, you know, and they said, oh no, we're done. Can we go? We're, we're kind of tired. Can we, can we go get back on the ferry and, and see all those bushes again? I'm like, no, 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 no. We haven't been to Space Mountain or Splash Mountain or, or Thunder Mountain. We've, no, we're, we're going to ascend the mountain is what we're going to do right now. <laughs> like, no, we're, we're, we're just kind of done. And I'm like, well, okay, it's whatever you want, whatever, whatever you want. And so we're leaving. And uh, we're about to go head back. And I'm, I'm kind of struggling inside internally. I'm having a little bit of a struggle until... One of them makes a comment, kind of looks at the other one and says, you know, outside of my encounters with Jesus, this has been the greatest day of my whole life. And I look, and then someone else is like, this is like the greatest day ever. And all of a sudden, I sit back, and I'm like, man, that's the magic kingdom right there. 
Who wants to stay till 11? I mean, I got how many of you think, no matter how much it costs, if I can go give one of our missionaries the greatest day of their life, I think that was totally worth the money. Anybody agree? What's your point? My, yeah, yeah, amen. Here's the point, though. Here's the point. Jesus says, there is a kingdom. Unless someone's born from above, unless someone's born of water and the Spirit, they'll never enter the kingdom of God. There is a kingdom that can be entered. The gospel is not that if you say a little prayer when you die, you'll enter the kingdom. The gospel is that Jesus has announced the entrance. He has paid the way for you to enter the kingdom of God. And everyone say these next, this next word, now. Now. That's why we pray on earth as it is in heaven. That's why we pray for the sick. That's why we believe God for goodness in the land of the living. That's why there is a day that's coming when we will die and all things will be made new. But ultimately, the end of this, according to Revelation, isn't just that we die and go up to heaven. At the end of this, heaven is coming down and going to renew all things. There's a renewal of everything that's going to take place, which means there's a kingdom that we can enter right now. Now, I need you catching this because if you don't understand this, this whole born again stuff will make no sense to which he says to Jesus when he's going through this conversation, verse 4, he says, how can this be? Jesus answers, unless you're born of water and the Spirit will never enter the kingdom. And it's kind of like, well, what, what does this even mean? And so Jesus says in verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh. Don't marvel, I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's been born of the Spirit. Now listen. There is a whole new life that's available, but only God can do it. It's something that only God can do, and it's done by his spirit. He says that the wind blows, and what he says is this. The wind is mysterious, that God is mysterious, that being born from above is mysterious. Being born from God is a mystery. Receiving salvation, it's, it's indescribable. It's too much for words. You, you can't pin it down. You cannot predict the Holy Spirit. You cannot bottle up the Holy Spirit. You cannot control the Holy Spirit. You cannot control God, but you can experience God. That's why he says, if you're born again, you will see the kingdom. Right now he says, if you're born of water and the spirit, you will enter the kingdom. In other words, the magic kingdom is available. The kingdom of God is available. Parents, tell your children you can hear from God. Parents, raise your children to know you've been wired to interact with God. Why are we so confident that we can hear from devils when we don't believe we can hear from God? I hear people say all the time, man, the devil made me do it. The de you think the devil can make it when the devil's been talking to me. Has it dawned on you that God knows how to talk even better than the devil? There's a kingdom that's available. Disciples, tell the people you disciple. You, can, you were wired to hear from God. I, it's weird. I have so much faith that I can hear from evil. I've always had so much faith that, yeah, yeah, man. I'm just a wretch. Uh, has it dawned on you that God knows how to turn wretches into something that's not so wretched anymore? What's the application of this? Live new. If you belong to Jesus, live new. Pray big. Believe large. Trust the Lord. Step out. Receive the inheritance that you've got from God. I, the inheritance that you get from Jesus. See, these controversial sayings are supposed to make you think. It's supposed to make the gears turn. You're not supposed to wait until you die to get your inheritance when your inheritance was given. When does an inheritance come? At the death of the person that did it. The good news of Jesus is he died. And then he rose, which means the inheritance is available now. See, only God can do it. He says it in verse 9. He says it again. He said, Nicodemus said, how, how can these things be? Now, this is a key word, how. I'm going to get there. How can these things be? And Jesus says, unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you'll never enter the kingdom. Well, what does that even mean? Like, what is it, Mike, what does this mean? Where are you going with this? I'm going to try to make clear to you that God wants it to be clear to us. But I can't come up with one word. I can't come up with, with one descriptor. I cannot come up with two or three syllables, which is why Jesus gave us something to help us say this. But to help you make sense of the passage, see if this means makes sense. Verse 12, Jesus said, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one's ascended into heaven except he who descended, the Son of Man, that's Jesus. As Moses was lifted up, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, that's Jesus, be lifted up that whoever believes 
in him may have eternal life. 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, good news, but in order that the world might be saved through him, whoever, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Did anybody catch the key word? Two syllables, starts with B, ends with V. Anybody catch the key word? Believe. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I heard that in Sunday school. Yeah, 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 believe. That's all you got to do is believe. The problem for us is when we hear the word believe, we, we think of it like the verb opine. Like in Spanish, there's a good verb, opinar. You know, it means to, to opine, to, to have an opinion, to make an opinion, to cast an opinion. But believing is not opinando. It's not opining. It's not changing your political... St- to be- what, what a lot of us have done is Mickey Mouse, believe. We've like <laughs> believed in the Lord and we've wondered why this hasn't happened. My friends, if your life is not so radically different that people would look at you and say, whoa, it is as if you've been born all over again. The answer might be because you believe, but you have not believed. <laughs> Do you believe what I'm saying? I believe. (laughs) Auditorium, right now, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Nicodemus comes to him and he represents all of these people who believe. And this is where we've got to struggle. Ephesians 2.8, every Bible Belt Christian knows you are saved by grace through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. Amen. The problem is, what is faith with a capital F? What is believe with a capital B as opposed to believe? What is the difference and how do we get there? I love how Romans 14, 17 describes the the believing that comes brings a kingdom that's coming. Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God, it's not eating and drinking. It's not just rules and rule keeping, but it's righteousness Peace and what? Joy in the Holy Spirit. Martin Luther wrote a fascinating commentary on the book of Galatians that has rocked the world of quite a few destiny changers throughout history. And he describes the righteousness of God in contrast to all the other righteousnesses in the universe. There's a political righteousness when someone's right with another country, there are emotional or relational righteousnesses where someone's like, hey, I'm right with you, you're right with me. There's moral righteousness, you keep the rules. All of these are what you would call active righteousnesses. It makes you right. You are righteous because of something that you do. You're righteous before the law if you've paid your taxes. It is active righteousness. And the problem with all of these are they are imperfect because they depend on your work, your labor, your striving. There is one other kind of righteousness that is utterly distinct, though. And he says, ironically, it is a righteousness that's not active, but passive. It's not something you can do. It's something that is done to you by God. It is not something you can strive for and earn by the work of your hands. It is a righteousness that is gifted to you like a parent that starts paying for prepaid college before the child is born. And when they say, whoa, what did I do to deserve this? Nothing you can do. It was a gift. It was just given to you. It's a righteousness that doesn't come because you tried hard, doesn't come because you pray harder, doesn't come because you keep more rules more uprightly than everybody else. It is a gift. Gift. It is a gift. It is the righteousness of God by capital F faith that comes when you believe. It is not a righteousness that comes by believing. It's a righteousness that comes when someone believes on Jesus. But we don't get it, and God knows that, which is why God has spoken so clearly. And what he says to us, and what Luther would say is the gospel, the news of Jesus, it, it is not good advice about what you can do to get right with God. It is the good news about what God has already done to get you right with God. Let me say it again. Jesus is not good advice about what you can do to get right with God. It's good news about what he has done. For God so loved, past tense, past tense, the world, that he gave, past tense, his only son, that whoever believes is going to receive this righteousness. It's going to be made right 
by God. In other words, let me lift Jesus up for a second. What Jesus has done in his life, what Jesus has done in his suffering, what Jesus did on the cross, what Jesus did with a crown of thorns, what Jesus did with the whips on his back, what Jesus did when he said it is finished, what Jesus did when he was buried, what Jesus did when he was raised is so sufficient. It is so thorough. It is so holistic. It is so 360. It is so total that anyone that trusts and relies on him is absolutely righteous forever. Amen. What Jesus has done is enough. He lived the life that you should have lived. He died the death that you should have died. He went on a cross and became a curse for us, to break the curse from us. He swallowed up death whole, was buried, conquered death, rose up. He's alive. The light has come. Every debt has been paid. Every curse has been broken. Every arrangement has been made. Now believe. But he knows we have a hard time with this. How do I know? Which is why I'm fascinated by this phrase, unless you're born of water and the Spirit. Well, what does that mean? Well, the first question to ask anytime you're interpreting the Bible would be, what would the original hearers have heard when they heard a phrase like, unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God? Well, well what is what does it mean to be born of water and the Spirit? And some people would say, and there's good minds that say things like, to be born of water means being born of a woman, and to be born of the Spirit means born of God. I don't think that's where Jesus is going because, frankly, there were already rabbis that used this phrase, rebirth and, and reborn. They already used this. In fact, they associate it with something in particular, which was an initiation act. It was a, a covenantal act. It was the act of immersing people in water where they would take them and they would be immersed in water. It's what we would call baptism, an immersion. And people would be immersed and they would come out new. And this would be this is how they the proselytes became uh, members of the covenant-keeping community as they would, they would come into this and, and they would become something that's new. So even though only God could do it, being immersed or baptized was how they would respond. And that's where this sermon's going to end today, is that you need to respond. The challenge is for us to think, okay, I think I've already heard all of this, but, but, but what does this mean? Well, here's where we've got 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Put that up there. 1 Peter 3, 21, it says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, it now saves you not as the removal of dirt from the body, but as a, what's the next word? Response. Everyone say response. Only God can save you, but it's up to you to respond. It's a response to God from a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, this is hard for us because 21st century people, we are whacked out. We think in different ways. We don't get what first century thinkers were getting. It's an Eastern book. We're Westerners. It's a first century book. We're 21st century people. But is it possible that God already knew that we'd have a hard time getting this whole salvation reality, which is why when the Bible talks and people say, well, Mike, what does someone need to do to be saved or to receive salvation or to go to heaven when they die or to be born from God. And, there's a, and, and you can't nail it down. And that's the problem. Everyone would like to nail it down. So if all you did was read John 3.16, you'd say, believe. But then you go read Acts 2.38 and it says, uh, repent and be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. And then you read another place, it says, confess your sins. You read another place, it says, confess Jesus Christ as Lord. You read another place where Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. If you don't confess me before men, I won't confess you before the Father. And you're like, whoa. Well, what is it? Do I believe? Yes. Do I need to confess? Yeah. Do I need to repent? Absolutely. Do I need to confess my sins? Mm-hmm. Do I need to turn? Yeah. It's, well, well, Mike, ah. But what is it? I'm telling you, friends, I think when we try to nail God down, we're missing where Jesus, it's like the wind. You can't nail the wind down. It's, it's, it's the wind. Believe, what does it mean to believe? It does mean to be baptized. It does mean to repent. It does mean to confess. It does mean to call out. It does mean to lean on. It, yeah, it means, but to which we come back as 21st century people. Watch this. Some of you sit at Kanapa Hall right now. The logical question is about to come. Someone's about to ask, are you about to say that unless I get baptized, I'm not saved? That's what someone's about to ask. Mike? Are you telling me, and here's what I would say, let's back up one step. When Jesus, what's the kingdom of God, Jesus? Define the kingdom of God. It's so fascinating. Jesus never defines the kingdom. Instead, he tells parable after parable and story after story and miracle after miracle to reveal the kingdom. See, what we're trying to do is explain the wind when you need to catch this. You cannot explain the wind, but you can experience the wind. You cannot control the wind, but God has given you sails that if you're willing, you can put them up and you can ride the wind. 
you can encounter the wind. Mike, can I control the kingdom? No, but you can enter it. Mike, can I explain the kingdom? No, but you can see the kingdom. Mike, can I nail down the kingdom? No, but you can hear the kingdom. You can sense it. Okay, so Mike, get to it. I got to know. I, I, I got to know. Any of you that are theologically inclined, Mike, baptismal regeneration or not? Tell me. Some of you are like, what was that, Martha? <laughs> you, you know, the, the reason the question is so silly in my mind is, is that I think baptism in water was one of God's genius revelation gifts to us to help us see what the natural mind doesn't just get with words. What do you mean? People come to me, they say, Mike, um, I'm getting married. Great, you get married. I got married at this altar right here. Do you say I do? Yes, I say I do. Could you imagine if someone came up to me and they said to me, uh, hey, man, we're going to get married. I just want to know, when are you officially married? Like, we've got the marriage license. People ask me that sometimes. They bring me the license. You know, Jennifer Smith's getting married. Is that okay that I say that? <laughs> Jennifer Smith's getting married. Do you guys have the license yet? Well, they do have the license. So people sometimes, she did not, but some people ask me, hey, I've got this license, so like, are we, are we already married or are we waiting for the ceremony? That's a legitimate question, isn't it? Like, now, you know what they're thinking. <laughs> I'm not sure, but you do. You, you might know what they're thinking because I don't think like that because I'm a preacher. With eight children, maybe I do. Okay, so, <laughs> so someone might say, well, wait, wait, technically, are we, are we already married? Then someone's like, well, no, 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 man. Well, no, no, you got to like, you got to go in the ceremony. Okay, wait, wait, so do I have to have a ceremony? Um, no, you don't have to. Okay, in the ceremony, do we have to say vows? Do we have to make vows? Um, do, do I have to say I do? Can you imagine me being at the altar and saying, do you take her? I do. Can you imagine someone be like, do I have to say I do to be married? I'd be, I'd be confused. And then if I say, you may kiss the bride. Can you imagine if they said, do we have to kiss? I mean, I've done a lot of weddings. I've never seen a man, any man, say something like, ask me the question, do we have to kiss? When we get to that place, all the men are like, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's what they're like, you know? <laughs> then they're going to go on a honeymoon and go consummate the whole thing. I've never had someone say, do we have to go? So here's what I'm trying to say. When someone asks, Mike, do I need to be baptized to be saved, obviously there's, there's, there's an exception in the Bible where you've got a guy that's a thief on a cross who never had a chance to get baptized. He was going to be with Jesus in paradise. So clearly the answer would be no, not in that kind of a way. But if you're even going there, when I hear all these, see what we have in baptism are two dangers. There are some people that make baptism too important. They act like baptism is what saves you and what saves you is Jesus, okay? Then there's other people that make it too unimportant. There are some people that say, I'm going to heaven. I, be, I am born again because I was baptized and they're wrong. And then you've got other people over here that will say, I am born again, therefore I don't need to be baptized, and they're wrong as well. And so what we have is the radical middle ground where we've got to bring baptism to the foot of the cross, to the work of Jesus, and to recognize that in baptism, the, the darkness of my depravity is exposed and the grandeur of God's glory and grace is revealed. In baptism, we see the, the gospel being preached in a life and through a life so that the water itself is almost preaching the eternal sermon of the grace of God, that what you could have never done yourself, God has done. And it's amazing. Mike, sir, are you saying I need to be baptized to be saved? I'm saying Jesus Christ told us in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples, baptizing them. Jesus commanded us to go make disciples and to baptize people. Well, what does this mean? Well, what does baptism mean? I'm going to walk over here to the tank. I want the cameras to follow me because I need you to understand where some of this stuff goes, okay? When a Jewish rabbi was baptizing someone, what they recognized that was when someone went into the water, when this was taking place, Jesus had all authority has been given. Jewish people knew. A, a first century person knew what this meant. When you go under, you're going to be baptized not just in water. You get baptized in a name. Jesus said, I want you to baptize them in the name. That means the character, the power, the authority of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. You're coming under the authority. Baptism is new authority. Baptism means I get it. I'm not in charge the one I'm being baptized is. I get it. I'm under new authority. I get it. I don't call my shots. So when someone says something like, well, do I, if I'm born from God, do I have to obey God? 
they're sort of revealing a, a, a bad part of their, of their life. It'd be like me going up to my wife and when I said, uh, will you marry me, you know, and I give her the ring. And she's like, oh man, thank you for this ring that you've saved up for for years now. Thank you so much. And then she takes the ring and sticks it in her pocket. I'm like, girl, take that ring out of the pocket. And she said, no, no, no. I don't want anybody to know about it, and I don't want to be legalistic and make you think that I'm only marrying you if I'm wearing the ring. I want you to know that I'm marrying you even if I don't wear the ring. Well, it's like a strange thing. And then imagine on the day when the pastor said, put the rings on the fingers as you make your vows, and I put the ring on her finger. Can you imagine her saying, no, I don't think so. I don't want anybody to know about this. I'm, I, do you want to marry the person that doesn't want anyone? Can you imagine someone saying, do you really have to live together if you're married? Do we have to kiss? Do we have to touch? Is it not, is it theoretically, is it not theoretically possible that we are married even if we do not kiss, touch, have a ceremony? Do you see how this is like, wait, wait, what a strange thing. That's exactly where we're at right now. I keep meeting Christian after Christian, person after person, utterly confused. You know what this means? This means I'm all in under new authority. He is the authority, I am not. This was a cleansing. It was a, it was a place when someone got wet, they were, they were being cleaned. It's a place where it represents, you're dirty. You've got a past. There's a stench. My friends, listen to me. The wages of sin is death. I'm in my car yesterday and and I just had some trash, or a couple days ago, I had some trash, and because of all the pollen, I can't smell anything, you know, and, and I'd forgotten to take it to the dumpster, and, and I went to take my wife out on a date, and Ruthie comes in the, in the, the, the SUV, and she's like, she's like, what is that? I'm like, I put some cologne on. She's like, no, it's not the cologne. It, it's not you. It's something else. She's like, what? that stinks. I'm like, no, 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 I don't smell anything, and then I remembered, oh, yeah, the back is full of junk. See, the, the, what some of us have forgotten because we've lived in it so long, until you get born from God, there is a stench in your soul that's got to get wiped. It's got to get clean. Baptism represents, I admit it, I'm dirty. I admit it, I'm a sinner. I proclaim to everyone, I'm a big-time sinner, but he's a bigger-time Savior. Yeah. That's what baptism does. When someone gets baptized, baptism furthermore, it would mean that someone like when a woman would get baptized, she was being baptized into this new name. Like even now, many Jewish women around the world, when they get married, they get married and they have to be baptized. They've got to bring a certificate of immersion showing they're being baptized into the name of their new spouse. Baptism was also, the rabbis would say, it was like a rebirth. It was like a burial. When you got baptized, you die. The old you dies. The old way of defining yourself dies. It doesn't matter how you were born the first time. This is why when everyone talks about, I feel like I was born to be, and they fill in the blank, the issue of scripture is you must be born all over again. It's not how you were born. It's how you get born again. It's not what you can do with what flesh and blood gave you. Your mom and dad gave you flesh. He's going to give you a spirit, and you die and you bury and the old you stays down and the old you goes down just like Jesus and then the new you comes up and you are new forever and ever. Yeah. You need to be baptized. If you've, some of you that have been a Christian for years and you've never been baptized, this is your day. Kanapaha, this is your day. I'm hoping to see some of you and hear about baptism that happened at the picnic today. Some of you that are in South Florida right now, maybe Orlando, Troy, fill up the bathtub and get ready right there. South Florida, get ready. Let me take a trip to the beach. Some of you may be watching online right now. Go fill up your bathtub and get ready to find a Christian or get your phone out and we'll find you. Know, put it over. Don't you know, let it fall in. And you get ready. Let's get ready. Some of you that are here right now, Auditorium A. This is the day to be born of water and the Spirit. Well, Mike, are you saying that that saves? No, no. You, Mike, do I get saved when I get baptized? You got saved when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. That's when you got saved. That's when it happened. When did that get paid for? See, there's also a way in which, though, and this is where I'm going to end this. One of the things that baptism does that I do not hear contemporary Christian, little case B, believe preaching, uh, signify to us is baptism It's the symbol of a covenant. It's a covenant. And I get it, the 21st century American contract keepers and breakers do not understand covenant. But a covenant is a profound place where by the shedding of blood, vows are made and they yoke you. They yoke you. They connect you. It's a covenant. The scriptures say that what Jesus gives us in salvation, it's not a political affiliation. It's not a club. It's a covenant. It's a new covenant. Probably the best way to end this sermon 
is in my favorite passage of all of the Old Testament, which is Genesis 15 where God goes to Abraham and makes him a promise. And the Bible says Abraham believed God and God counted it to him as righteousness. It's the classic faith passage of the Bible. Believe. How do you do it? You believe. Capital B, believe. When you believe, it gets counted to you as righteousness. That's what does it. It's belief. And this is what happens after that. Then Abraham says to him, Ah, I do believe. He's already righteous. I'm so glad God meets us where we are, not where we should be. And Abraham says to God, God, I believe you. But how can I know this is going to be true? How many of you are glad that God can handle, it's kind of like Abraham in the great faith passage of the Bible is basically saying, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Praise God. What does God do? This is what he does. He says, Abraham, go take out a heifer, go take out a goat, get some animals, chop them into pieces. He chops the animals into pieces. He lays some right here. He lays some right here. He puts some right here. He puts some over here. He lays out the animals, and this is covenant-keeping activity because the way you would cut a covenant, and again, someone could say, Mike, this is so old school. Do you understand that just like there are some realities that heaven knows that we're supposed to know, that we're supposed to get, just because your culture doesn't bring this out does not mean it's not true. It's a covenant. My American culture knows nothing of covenant. I confess that to you. I've had to learn that from God. And frankly, when I hear people say, all you got to do is believe in Jesus, yes, that's true as long as you understand that believe means you're entering a whole new covenant. The pieces are laid out, and this is what God does. He lays, how can I know that you're going to keep your word, God? I made you a promise, Abraham. How can I know? He lays out the animal. The blood is shed. The flesh is broken. The, The pieces are laid out. And then God does an interesting thing. He puts Abraham to sleep. His name is Abram, puts him to sleep. And while he does, God ends up coming and appearing in a pot of fire. And God himself passes through the pieces of flesh. He passes through the blood. God himself. And the way that you would do a covenant was, you would make an oath while passing through the pieces of the flesh. And when you did, you are saying, may what happen to these pieces of flesh happen to me if I ever break my word to you. But Abraham has an interesting thing happen because he's sleeping. God has put him to sleep. He's got to be in a passive mode, not an active mode. And the Bible says God made a covenant with Abraham that day. What's your point? It is as if God himself says to Abram, and he says to you, Abram, may what happen to these pieces of flesh happen to me if I ever break my word to you. But it's beyond that, because Abram never walked through. So it's as if he says, and Abram, may what happened to these pieces of flesh happen to me if you ever break your part of this word. I'm going to establish a covenant that depends not on your faithfulness, but on mine. Not on your goodness, but on mine. Not on your virtue, but on mine. And when you have the days when you deserve to be forsaken, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. And when you have the days when you've been faithless and you knew better and you should not have, and you do, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. And it's like a tension in the Old Testament scriptures because it's like, how could this ever happen? How would God ever fulfill this? Because God's people did break faith. God's people were unfaithful. How could God, you're a spirit, how could God be torn apart? But it was in some hill Scholars tell us close to where that covenant was cut, that centuries later, Jesus Christ would come, God in the flesh, and his flesh would be torn apart, and the blood would be shed, and he would say, this is my body broken for you. And it's on that cross, when we come to God, maybe even some of you right now, you're like, God, you give me all these promises. How can I know it's true? Christians, how can you know? Because he passed through the blood. He passed through the flesh. He went up on a cross. He died for your sins. So where does that leave us? It leaves us where I'm calling you today to seal the covenant with God. If you have never been baptized, this is your day. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never said yes to God, this is the time. In like 30 seconds, I'm going to say a prayer of repentance, a prayer of born again, a prayer of response to God. And if you've not yet responded to God, this is your day. There's some of you that maybe you even thought you're born again and you weren't. This is the time. You must be born again. Is your life different? If it's not different, you might not be different. Maybe this is the good news. This is the day it starts. Maybe you believed, and today's the day you're going to believe. South Florida, 
online, Kanapaha, right now. Everyone in the house, I want you praying with me right now. And if you need to turn to God, this is your chance. If you know that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, this is your chance. You're about to be forgiven in the next 60 seconds of your life. Here it comes. Pray this with me. Say, dear God. Say it out loud. Say, dear God. I believe you. I will trust you. I declare my allegiance to you. Jesus is Lord. Take my heart. Forgive me. I confess Jesus. I am yours. I believe you died on the cross and you rose from the dead. Be my leader. Be my forgiver. Be my everything. Now let that sink in. There might be some of you right now, it's happening. It's happening. You're coming alive right now. Right now, you're coming alive. It's faith. Do you believe, could it be true? Is, is this possibly true? Yes. But here's the second part of this. There's some of you that are here right now. Auditorium A, Auditorium B, Orlando, South Florida, online. Some of you that are watching right now and you've never been baptized in water. This baptism, this is where it gets see. It's all of you. It's, it's covenant. It's, it's authority. It's the a command of the Lord. This is where you submit, you say, I'm in. In less than a minute, I'm going to be asking some of you to make a bold stand, to stand your feet and to say, okay, I'm going to get baptized. You might say, well, Mike, I'm not ready for that. You know what? Some of you are not ready for it, but I am. I got a Puerto Rican wife. I got hair nets, hair ties, hair covers. I got changes of clothes. I got towels here. I want my family to see it. We got photographers ready to take pictures. There is nothing that can keep you from doing this. I got my family with me. Fine, ask your family. Let's have the whole family get baptized together. It'd be nothing like that. We had a mom and son just get baptized. Last, like 18 people got, 15 people got baptized last service. Beautiful time. Right now, if you need to get baptized, I want you to get ready. So here it is. In about 30 seconds, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet if you need to be baptized. I'm going to ask you to go bold. No more being like Nicodemus in the dark. You're coming in the light. You're like, you know what? Jesus is the Lord. Whether you've been a Christian for 30 years or 30 seconds, this is your time. Now, altar workers, I want you guys ready. Campus pastors, get ready because I'm about to say it. And when I say three, if you need to get baptized, I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to stand up, boldly proclaim. You might be saying, Mike, I'm not sure. Listen, baby. Kick people out of the way if you have to. Jesus is the Lord. He is the King. If you need to be baptized, if this is the day, you're ready to go all in on this covenant. On the count of three, I want you to stand to your feet. Ready? Kanapaha, auditorium A. One, two, three. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet right now. If you need to be baptized, yeah. Who else? Yeah. Who else? Don't be afraid. Who else? Good. Good. Beautiful. Yes, 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 yes. Who else? Auditorium A right now. Who else? Right there, Pastor Bobby, yeah, that's good. Mike, should I count the cost? Yeah, you should count the cost. But at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the King. That's who it is, yeah. All right, all of you that are standing up right now, we've got, this is what I'm gonna do. In the back, we've got changing rooms in the back. We're gonna sing, we're gonna get ready to go into a song and all this kind of stuff. All of you that are standing, I'm gonna walk out the back. Come follow me this way. We got, all, we got people that will walk you to the changing room. We will give you changes of clothes. And in just a few minutes, we're going to celebrate these baptisms. If you're online, you go fill up your bathtub. You do something like that. Ask them how we can do this. We'll get that. Kanapa Hall, mid-Florida, South Florida. You, if you guys are ready for this, you talk to the pastors right now, and we're going to get ready to go. But church, in Jesus' name, let's do this. Thank you for joining us at Greenhouse today. Thanks for being with us in heart and your spirit Every time we gather in his name, and he is there, and it's a joy for us to make much of Jesus. We hope that you've uh, really had your eyes fixed on him, worshiped on the spot, and know where to go with it this week. If by chance you need some prayer, we'd love to pray with you. You can email us at, at prayer at greenhousechurch.org, and confidentially you can go and reach out to someone that would love to be there to pray with you, uh, to agree with you in anything that you have a need for. Prayer at greenhousechurch.org. Dot org. Let us be the church with you. And if by chance you just want to make a difference in this world, I, I can promise you this. Uh, we are wildly committed to being dangerously generous. We give more than 50% of everything away to missions in the poor. If you'd be willing to help us do this and what we're doing here, uh, why don't you consider giving and being a part of the vision of what it is that we're doing? Uh, you can click on one of the links that'll just kind of show you how that you can give and literally the money that you give would be going to change things from America all over the world. Uh, we'd love for you to be a part. Thanks for being with us today. God bless you.